What is up, y'all? Kevin Kuhn here from Athlete Factors. This is the Athlete Factors podcast. My guest today is Dr. Jill Parnell. How are you today? I'm doing great. Excellent. Excellent. So I'm really excited to have you on uh, to talk about um, endurance runners and and exercise-induced gastrointestinal issues. So um, take it away. Tell us a little bit about your background and uh, yeah, we'll go from there. All right. Well, thanks for having me. I am uh, in Calgary, Alberta, so I am just a little bit east of the Rocky Mountains. Um, And I did a PhD at the University of Calgary, which was um, much more biomedical than my sport performance stuff that I do now. So I was doing a lot of work with uh, prebiotic fibers and Mm. looking at how that could affect hormone levels to try to minimize obesity. So we were looking at altering the gut bacteria to try to increase uh, hormones that make you feel full. Mm. After I was done that, I got a job at Mount Royal University, which is where I'm currently located. And that is also in Calgary. And there I switched to some sports performance stuff because that was what I was primarily interested in. And it was a lot more easy to do at that particular institution, which is more uh, teaching focused. It's a smaller university with smaller class sizes. They don't have the same lab facilities. So I switched into that. Um, Yeah, personally, I am not an elite athlete. (laughs) I love to run. I love to mountain bike. I love to downhill ski and I do all of those things. Um, But I sadly don't don't have the genetic makeup to be a pro athlete. Well, yeah, the genes, the the super elite genes definitely help, don't they? (laughs) Yeah, but I love it and I, I do what I can. For sure. That's awesome. So, um, I've, I've got quite a few clients who have dealt with their fair share of gastrointestinal issues. I've got other clients who seem to never have any GI issues at all. So um, how common are these types of things uh, in endurance running or in endurance sports? Right. So the answer kind of depends on a little bit, obviously, on who you are and what you're doing. Um, But the range is estimated to be between 30 and 90 percent. So it's pretty broad depending on the different types of studies that you look at. Mm -hmm. Um, So and that has to do with Um, typically you tend to see more issues with the longer distances. So if you get into like ultra marathon type um, that races, then those will have sort of a higher incidence. Um, Mm -hmm. Females tend to have a little bit more problems than males. And we can talk a little bit about why that is if if you want. Um, And then again, the level of intensity that you're working at and your age can also play into it. But it is quite high in runners, like I said, between 30 to 90 percent. And it seems to be higher in runners compared to other endurance sports. So mm-hmm. even if you look at cyclists versus runners, you tend to see the incidence being the highest in runners. And it's probably most studied in runners because it is such an issue for so many runners. Gotcha. Yeah, because um, I work with quite a few triathletes and while they're biking, uh, they can eat a, a much wider variety of foods and a lot more food from from then to then when they transition to running they're like it's got to be you know very bland it's got to be uh a little more dialed into to specific things so that that's really interesting um so let's talk a little bit about like the specific symptoms what what are the specific symptoms that we're seeing So you have a spectrum for the specific symptoms and typically they get divided up into sort of upper GI issues, which would include things like um, acid reflux or that burning feeling, uh, burping. Then you have sort of lower GI symptoms, which would be things like the bloating and um, the diarrhea or the sort of need to go to the bathroom in the middle of your race. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you have also sort of the 
what people would think like a side ache or a stitch, like the cramping and those types of feelings, which can be either upper or lower. Excellent. And then some people will have just overall um, sort of symptoms that would affect, say, um, ability to to focus or, you know, the, the dizziness and the headaches, those types of sort of broad symptoms. Gotcha. So it's more than just, um, and I guess just quote unquote stomach related, it, it kind of overlaps into other areas as well. That's really interesting to me because I would have never assumed that something like a side stitch would be caused by, you know, uh, something related to diet per se. So, yeah, I mean, ultimately the problem is that while your body is trying to exercise, it's shunting all of its resources to the muscles and so mm -hmm. what that does is it shunts blood flow um, away from your gi tract and a lot and so what that does then is that limits the ability of your gastrointestinal tract to function appropriately and mm. particularly if you get into um the longer events then you're in this situation where not only do you have to have the resources to continue to exercise for long periods of time. But because those events are so long, it's really, you also have to take in some sort of uh, nutrient during the events. And so then you get into the situation where your body is trying to manage both. It's trying to use all of its resources to keep your muscles going, but it's also trying to digest and it has to split those resources between those those activities and mm -hmm. that's what causes the strain or the stress right gotcha yeah because uh the body is all about efficiency right so it wants to be as efficient as possible while you're while you're training or while you're competing and so yeah to have the digestive system be doing a lot of work it's like eh, this is a little counterproductive here but yeah yeah as soon as you get into that stuff that's a little longer it's you you know that glycogen gets tapped out pretty quick. So yeah, that's good stuff. So um, in your paper, and I guess we should mention that, um, I found you through a paper that was published in the Journal of the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Um, the paper is called Dietary Restrictions in Endurance Runners to Mitigate Exercise-Induced Gastrointestinal Symptoms. So in the paper, you cover three uh, causes or mechanisms of action. Um, sorry, not three, uh, four. So can you talk a little bit about those, uh, the physiological, the nutritional, mechanical, and psychological factors? Yeah, so the first, the physiological symptoms, I've kind of talked a little bit. It's about that idea that during exercise, blood flow to the GI tract, which is really what you need to get oxygen to your, your cells for function and, and take waste away, that gets limited during exercise. And so the blood flow, because it's significantly reduced, that reduces the ability of the, of the gastrointestinal tract to digest food and absorb those nutrients and essentially do its job. That's kind of the main physiological factors that people are, are, are most well established. They've actually measured like blood flow during exercise and they look at, you know, how much is it reduced and um, then how that can affect the digestive system's ability to function. Um, the psychological is interesting because um, it's just the impact of stress on the GI on the GI tract, and you'll probably notice this. Most people, if they're stressed out, they'll actually feel it in their stomach. It's that like butterfly mm. in your stomach, anxiety type situation. And mm -hmm. so, what's interesting about that is, in a race, not only are you stressed out, but you're also going at your highest intensity. So you get that double uh, impact on your gastrointestinal tract it's trying to deal with the fact that it's got all these stress hormones and and then on top of that you're asking it to to do a, or to perform at a very high level um, but some of the research has shown that just day-to-day -day stress as well can impact the gastrointestinal symptom and so or the gastrointestinal tract and so that can also um, affect just your day-to-day -day training 
Mm. Um, and then one of the things that I don't, I can't remember if I talk about it too much in the paper, but of course, all of this is also going to affect the profile of the bacteria that live in your gut as well. And so there's a lot of research coming out now looking at the profile of the bacteria in the gut in athletes and how their training can impact it and how that might impact um, symptoms and performance and overall health as well. So that's that's in there. Um, and then the last one is the mechanical aspect of the sport. And this is probably why they feel like running um, affects people more than other sports is mm -hmm. just because when you're cycling, your body is relatively stable, your upper body. And so you don't have the same like jiggling up and down um, mm -hmm. mechanical type. So it's just the fact that there's a lot of things moving up and down and moving around. There's a lot of bouncing involved in running. Um, mm -hmm. And also that can generate the heat, which is uh, another thing that they think can affect the gastrointestinal tract. Wow. I would have never thought of that. Um, you know, like my assumption would just be like, yeah, if you're training intensely or competing intensely while you're running and you're doing, you know, the equivalent level of work while you're biking, um, it'd be the same, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a whole lot more moving. There's a lot more moving pieces when you're running. So that does make sense. That's, that's really interesting. So, um, so to, to come up with the, the data, let's say, for this study that you did, um, you used a questionnaire. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so the whole driver behind the, the questionnaire is that we have a lot of sport nutrition recommendations, and the recommendations are very specific in the sense of you should get this many grams of carbohydrate per kilogram body weight, um, on a daily basis, this many post-exercise. So we have very good recommendations looking at sort of the amount of nutrients that people need. We can say, you know, you need this much vitamin D, you need this much protein, this much carbohydrate, but there's not really any recommendations about using actual foods to get those nutrient intakes. So there's just kind of a blanket statement of, well, too much fat, too much fiber might not be good. And other than that, go ahead and figure it out. <laughs> and so we wanted um, <laughs> to really help people um, move those recommendations beyond the amounts of the macro and micronutrients to specific food choices, because I felt that that was where people often struggled. They knew how mm. much carbohydrate they should be getting, but they couldn't figure out how to get that carbohydrate in the context of the foods that they should actually be eating and which ones could minimize their symptoms. So that was the driver behind it. Mm -hmm. um, I did work with two other um, researchers who are on the paper. One is Kellyanne Erdman, and she is um, one of our Olympic athlete dietitians at the Olympic mm. Oval over in at the University of Calgary. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we had a lot of experience working with the athletes. And so we got together and we came up with the questionnaire and we had a list of food groups that we thought would be problematic. Mm -hmm. And so we went through, we developed all our questionnaire and then we ran it past a whole bunch of sports dietitians, took their feedback to make sure that it made sense and um, that the questions were clear and that they would target. So we had to consider things like, we're asking people what foods they avoid, but if they just avo avoid that food on a regular basis, how are we going to tease that out, right? So mm -hmm. if they're like, mm -hmm. well, I avoid gluten pre-running, but I always avoid gluten. We're like, well, that's, we have to figure that out. Gotcha. So we had to develop it, taking all of those other considerations into context. Mm -hmm. And then we run it past a host of people and we test them once and we test them again and we make sure that their answers are consistent. Uh, so that's our reliability testing. Mm -hmm. And then once we have that, we go and we use the questionnaire. So I think we had about five, over 500 people complete the questionnaire. Mm. That's really cool. Yeah, I, uh, I was able to print it off and take a look at it and kind of run through it. So I think uh, for people who are, you know, really interested in this, uh, it's an open access journal. So anyone can go and, and print your paper off and, and get access to that. 
um, to that questionnaire and take a look at it, which, you know, I think for a lot of people just looking at it, it's kind of eye opening just to see like, oh, I never even thought of that. Like I should, I should be more mindful of these things. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so you've got all that data. Um, how are you, how are you compiling it? How are you running the stats and what are the, what were the big, uh, what were the big points? What stuck out to you? Right. Okay. I won't give you too much stats detail. I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't want a lesson in statistics, but, <laughs> um, right. So first of all, what we did is we collected the data. So we went to, um, running races. We went to, um, race package pickup. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, people would come and pick up their package, the race, and we'd be there and we'd be like, Hey, would you mind filling out this questionnaire? Um, and we went to some running clinics to get a, to meet people and ask them to complete the questionnaire. So they complete it like face to face, you know, after their race. Mm -hmm. Um, and then once we got all of the data, we pulled out the people who had um, specific allergies to certain foods, because in that case, you're, you're avoiding a food because, you know, you're a risk for an anaphylactic reaction. So we, we didn't want that to confuse it. Mm -hmm. um, and then if people had any medical conditions that would affect their, their intakes, then we also removed those people. And then... We did also remove people who have had like IBS, IBD, and celiac disease. But what's interesting about that is we do have their data and we are going to look at it. Mm -hmm. And just on, on a side note, when I was talking about gender, it's interesting that out of, you know, the 500 runners that we interviewed um, or took data from, we had about 40 or so with um, IBS and IBD, and they were all female. We didn't have any male... Mm. Um, so, you know, just to kind of highlight that there is sort of a gender influence there. Hmm. Once we kind of sifted through all the data, cleaned it all out, um, then we looked at the frequency. So, you know, what percentage of people avoided these foods? Um, and then we looked at the differences between gender. We looked at differences between, um, age groups. So in that case, we had, um, younger athletes and then we had master's athletes, which, um, I was a bit shocked to discover is like 34 and older was our, our master's athlete age. Like, oh, man, <laughs> yeah. cardiac output decreases at age 35. I was oh, really hoping man. I had a bit longer, but no. I turned 34 <laughs> in two weeks. So thanks. Thanks for that. This is your year. <laughs> your year to shine. Make the most oh, of it. This is it. Got to gotta go out with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and then lastly, we looked at different, um, events. So a five kilometer, it's all endurance, right? So mm -hmm. five kilometer was the shortest we had. Um, but we had 5k, 10k, um, like between 10k and the half marathon distance, which is 21k. Oh, mm. I don't know what they are in miles. <laughs> and then, and then a marathon mm. distance. I know marathon is 26 miles. Yes. I think, I think a half marathon is 11, something like that. Yeah. But uh, we essentially, we broke it up into those distances um, to see if there were any differences there. Yeah. The conversions are tough. No, nobody likes doing those conversions. I know. I have to admit, I don't like miles because they're so much longer. <laughs> I don't feel like I'm making any progress. With a kilometer, I'm like, ooh, that yeah, was you can, quick. You can That's over those in five off. minutes. We're good. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, although I'm sure That's people can fun. run a five minute mile, but not me. <laughs> yeah, that was a, that took a little getting used to in high school. Everything that we did was in miles. And then in college, we switched to doing some of our training in, in K's. And I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> and then, you know, you just, it's just a shorter distance. You're still running the same pace. And eventually it's like, oh, okay. It's no big deal. It's the same. <laughs> but like, everybody's always converting like, okay, what's this K convert to pace wise to the mile? All right. Okay. We're good. We're on like <laughs> takes some getting used to, but. Does. So, um, okay. You did ask me about the results, which I'm sure is what people are most interested in hearing about. So <laughs> when we look at kind of the top foods that people would avoid, um, as would be, so we said, you know, in the one to four hours prior to, to exercise is kind of the, the time frame that we were looking at. Um, so meat products were high up there and that we were kind of expecting because 
protein just takes a little bit longer to digest than carbohydrates. It takes a little bit more time, a little bit more resources. Um, mm -hmm. So that can be problematic. Um, but what's interesting is that um, there is evidence kind of suggesting that there might be some benefit of protein, uh, particularly during the more, uh, the longer endurance exercise. Um, so another study that I was working on pre-COVID was looking at runners and I was looking at different amounts of protein shakes pre-run and putting them on the treadmill and then assessing their GI symptoms. Mm. So we're trying to figure out, you know, maybe meat is not the best option, but if protein is useful, then is there a threshold and what would be the best way to get it? So that's kind of part of the idea of this study is that it will hopefully now direct research into specific food options. Gotcha. And what's um, the, so, uh, oh, sorry. Awesome. So what's the, uh, uh, the, the theory or the rationale behind why protein would be beneficial during the longer stuff. Cause I'm, uh, like I'm always trying to promote my, my clients and endurance athletes get enough protein. Like in general, endurance athletes tend to be, you know, protein deficient. So, um, if there's, if there's another, uh, strategy that I can use to explain to them, like, Hey, here's another reason why it's important to get it in all the time, but even while you're training or while you're racing. Uh, so what's the rationale behind, uh, yeah. protein so there are a few theories behind it and it's still definitely not well established, right? Like when you look at the role of protein and exercise, the benefits in strength and muscle mass and promotion and muscle, you know, muscle synthesis it is much more robust than the research in endurance athletes. Mm -hmm. But um, some of the evidence just suggests that maybe it might provide sort of if you've got these carbohydrates being digested quite quickly and then you've got these proteins being digested a little bit more slowly then if you combine those you might get maybe a little bit more of a, an even energy release mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. you know there's very little or not not a lot of research i would say on that um and then some of the other research looks at muscle soreness with protein. Mm -hmm. um, so particularly, you know, if you're running ultras and you're doing a lot of running downhill, maybe some protein during exercise might help minimize that. Mm -hmm. And then again, there's some research looking at it may have some uh, cognitive benefits. So mm -hmm. being able to... Um, stay, I don't want to say stay happier while you're exercising, but, you know, maintain a positive mental attitude while you're exercising and, and yeah. focus. Um, but again, that's hmm. not, not well established. It's, you know, they're still kind of teasing that out. Gotcha. Um, but it is interesting to kind of think of if it is beneficial and if it is beneficial, then how do we, what is the threshold? What is the amount, um, hmm. for people? Awesome. Cool. So, so um, what were some of the other, uh, major, major, uh, I guess headlines from, right. from that study? So, um, next was milk products. A lot of people avoiding dairy mm. during exercise. Um, as part of the questionnaire, we did ask them why they avoided the foods that they avoided. But mm -hmm. we didn't specifically ask for each food that they said they avoided. Why did they avoid that specific food? Um, so we're not exactly sure why people are avoiding, say, specifically milk products. Um, we just know that it aggravates them. But um, mm. a lot of people, this is one where it's interesting because in sort of the other symptoms that people could experience, they would report like mucus production. Uh, and so there's some research saying that maybe dairy products could could stimulate that and that could cause um, difficulty while exercising. Mm -hmm. uh, as we expected, anything super high in fiber isn't ideal during exercise just because it can promote motility. So it can help push things through your GI tract, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> I'm not saying high fiber is bad, um, yeah. but maybe not not pre-race. Yeah, the timing so, is, is very key there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Chocolate was funny. actually another big one that people really? avoid. 
Yeah, and you know, a lot of people who have issues with um, gastrointestinal symptoms just generally find chocolate can aggravate them. Mm -hmm. So things like acid reflux can be aggravated by chocolate. Um, and then the interesting ones for the caffeine ones, because caffeine definitely has uh, performance benefits, particularly for endurance exercise, but mm -hmm. things like coffee and teas and energy drinks were actually some of the ones that people avoided uh, quite commonly. Mm. Um, and again, that's just, it can aggravate your stomach and, and cause issues. What's interesting about those ones is the distance and the age kind of played into what people were avoiding. So for instance, in the shorter distances, like a 5k or a 10k, people might avoid caffeine, but in the longer distances, we were actually seeing that fewer people were avoiding coffees and teas. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then the only other one I think that kind of I would flag is some of the sports drinks and sports foods can aggravate people. Um, mm. And so you do have to sometimes be careful, try them out, see which ones work for you, play around with them because different ones will have different carbohydrate mixtures and ratios. Mm -hmm. um, but those can also aggravate people. And I find particularly with the ultra endurance runners, they do tend to uh, lean towards actual foods a lot more um, sometimes than than the sports specific foods. Um, I don't know if it's just that they're doing so much of it, they just get sick of particular yeah. uh, sport bar that they're using. But you know, I do find that they like to have the whole foods. And so you'll see, see things like people eating potatoes during their long runs or whatnot. Mm -hmm. It's probably cheaper too. I mean, if you got to go through well, like 20 <laughs> cliff bars in a run, like phew, you better be loaded. <laughs> that's true so. <laughs> so you mentioned uh some major differences between uh the genders um but there were also i think some age-related uh differences and you kind of touched on a little bit of these so um can you go through some of those again and just uh starting out with just the gender differences and then we'll kind of flow through there yeah okay sounds good so in general, um, females were more likely to avoid foods than males. Um, and particularly, we see that quite high with, with the milk and the dairy products. That seemed to be one that females would avoid more so. Um, but in general, females had higher symptoms. Um, and consequently, it makes sense that they were avoiding more foods. Mm -hmm. Now, there could be other reasons. You know, there's some evidence that suggests that maybe certain, that there's a gender effect on the interest and the concern around nutrition as well. But I feel like when you get to athletes, they're, they're pretty aware of their nutrition. You know, it only takes a couple of really bad experiences to be like, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> that, that was really unpleasant. I'm going to start paying attention to what I yeah. eat now. Let's not do that again. <laughs> yeah, pretty sure. much. Yeah. yeah. So we definitely saw, saw that. Um, and then also the age differences. So in general, as you get older, we saw fewer symptoms and fewer avoidances. And there's a few reasons for that. One is part of it might just be experience, right? So as you are older, you've been competing longer, you know what to avoid. Also the, um, the body's ability to kind of respond to exercise in a way can decrease with age, which means that that whole shunting of the blood flow away from the from the GI tract can be a little bit less uh, intense. Mm -hmm. And then also there's a an intensity level as well. You know, we look at younger athletes; they're able to push themselves at a higher intensity typically than than the older athletes, and mm -hmm. so that might be kind of playing into why they're, they're getting more symptoms. Mm -hmm. So we kind of looked at that. So we see again, in general, more foods being avoided by the younger athletes than, gotcha. the, than the older athletes. Yeah. And then as it relates to, um, performance level and, and training and competition, uh, distance, what's the, uh, what are the differences there? Yeah. So when we look at the distances, 
Um, a lot more things can be avoided at the shorter distances just because, you know, you can get through a 5K. You don't need to, you don't really need to have a whole bunch of glycogen stores ready to go and resources available. So, mm -hmm. you know, they can get away with eating less and relying on less pre-race than if you're running the longer distances where you really do need to make sure that you've got as much energy reserves as you can because you're going to go through them right mm -hmm. so we cut we do see that um as i mentioned the caffeine was avoided a little bit more at the shorter distances as well and i mean theoretically at a five kilometer race you are going at a higher intensity right mm -hmm. and my 5k pace is faster than my marathon pace mm -hmm. so um because of that intensity people need to they will avoid things a little bit more. Um, the longer distances is where you really see the high fiber foods being avoided uh, mm. a lot more. Um, whereas the, like I said, the coffees and the teas are avoided a lot less at those distances. And that's just because likely of the research showing that the caffeine can have performance benefits over the longer periods of time. Gotcha. So a few weeks ago I had on uh, a, a former college buddy of mine. Um, and he just attempted to run a hundred mile race. And so he, he had never run anything further than a marathon. And so when he hit, <laughs> when he hit 26.3 miles, that was the longest he'd ever run. And then he was only a quarter of the way done. Um, he only made it 64, but he was flying the entire time. Like he was, he was rolling. He's super fast. Anyway, um, shout out to Nick. Um, he was saying that uh, as much as possible, he was trying to to limit all of his calories to liquid um, and just trying not to eat at all with the uh, kind of the, the theory behind that being, well, it's so much easier for the body to process, you know, liquids versus solid food. So do you think that's a, a good strategy to have? And obviously for some people it works really well. I know some people who try to get as much as they can via liquid and, and try to avoid solid foods altogether. But then other people who are like, no, 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 I'm going to get all my calories from food. I'm going to get all my electrolytes from, from liquid. And, and, you know, that's kind of the recipe they follow. So do you think there's um, does all that just run down to personal preference or is there, are there strategies that, that seem to work better than others? Yeah. I mean, so liquids do digest a lot more quickly and a lot more easily than solid foods. So, you know, you might be able to digest your smoothie in 20 minutes and it might take you an hour to digest your, a solid meal. So often that is a strategy, particularly for people who like early morning workouts and they don't have a long time prior to their workout. Like we say, you know, you should try to give yourself at least an hour to digest your food. And so mm -hmm. if you're, if you're pushing that timeline, then the liquid options can be beneficial. Um, the problem is also though, because they digest that much more quickly, you have to be a little bit more on top of it, right? Like you can't, you have to stay your every like 15 or 20 minutes or whatever it is. Whereas solid foods, they're going to digest a little bit more slowly. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you don't necessarily like you can give it a little bit of time, but it's going to be a slower release of the energy. So, you know, personally, I find, um, I mean, it's been a couple of years since I've done a marathon, but I couldn't do it on liquids only. I needed, I needed the solids and I found that was beneficial to me just to kind of have that in my stomach. And mm -hmm. so, you know, again, a lot of it does come down to personal preference. I would say if you've got that short period of time pre-race and you're not doing a super long race, then, then the liquids is a good, good idea if that works for you. Mm -hmm. Um, so it does kind of come down to personal preference, but I wouldn't discourage people from trying out solids, particularly if you're taking them in small bites mm -hmm. and, you know, you're kind of spreading that, that out. I think it does for some people just kind of helps settle their stomach or they, they find it works as well. So awesome. I really like like the little, the gummies, you know, the energy chews. Mm -hmm. those I think those help and those are good too because you can kind of suck on them and 
um, there is a fair amount of research looking at like carbohydrate mouth swishes for the shorter yes. distance for, for people who really struggle with anything in their stomach. And so I just kind of find like having a little gummy stuck in my cheek, like a chipmunk there kind of <laughs> gives me a little bit of sugar, kind of distracts me. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's stick one when, in every kilometer or something. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever yeah. it takes. So when I was first introduced to the whole idea of, of the carbohydrate rinse, like, I was like, what is, what is a carbohydrate rinse? I'm like reading this study. I'm like, what are they talking about? This is so strange. Like, um, are they, are they swallowing whatever, like, wh what is this? What's going on? And it's so interesting that just the sensation of, of like sweetness in your mouth can improve performance, which is just the human body is so crazy. It's so complex. It's so cool. Um, yeah. Who knew? It's crazy stuff. I know, it's the brain. <laughs> yes, it's fantastic. So um, so how can athletes get a better understanding of what foods may be causing them issues? And um, yeah, let's just start with that. Yeah, so a lot of it is going to come down to the individual athlete and trial and error. You're right, there are people who can like eat anything and go for a run and they don't have any troubles. And then there are people who have much more sensitive GI tracks and they have to be a lot more careful. So for sure, you're going to do a little bit of trial and error. What I can tell you is that um, the solid proteins seem to be a bit difficult for people. So things like chicken or fish or beef, those definitely um, cause more trouble than some of the other foods. Um, dairy products are a good thing to avoid. Um, and there's been a fair amount of research looking at the FODMAP foods, which mm. is a way of classifying foods based on the carbohydrates and how they get fermented by the gastrointestinal tract. Mm. So if you are struggling, avoiding foods that um, have gluten in them, avoiding foods that have the lactose and the dairy in them, and then I would just encourage people if, if they are struggling to try a lower FODMAP diet. And in that case, you just have to Google it. It's not a super intuitive diet to follow. Some fruits are high, some fruits are low. Uh, so you do have to kind of go and Google it and get the list. It's not a uh, super you know, intuitive thing. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the then you're starting to get into, well, certain fruits might work and certain fruits might need to be avoided. Mm -hmm. um, the Like the legumes, so things like beans and chickpeas can be problematic because they're relatively high in fiber and relatively high in protein. So mm -hmm. if people are struggling, I think the go-tos are things like potato, rice, like the, the gluten-free grains seem mm -hmm. to work for people. And... Um, you know, some of the, the fruits and vegetables that will digest a little bit more easily, um, fruits maybe a little bit more so than, than the vegetables. Those types of foods seem to work for people. Um, we had a few people that avoided nuts, but generally something like a peanut butter or an almond butter was pretty common for people to, to like pre-exercise. So that's, those types of things would work. Gotcha. So not sure how clear. <laughs> That was no, as that's... far as things to try and things not to try. But no, that's that's good. That's like a, a really good place for people to start. So for um, so I'm I'm now working with a lot more youth runners, and so that's going to be a really good tool for me to to direct them towards. Just to say, hey, like if you're, um, you know, if they show up and they're like, hey, you know, Coach Kevin, my stomach hurts. I'm gonna be like, okay, well, what'd you eat today? Half the time they're like. I don't remember. And then the other <laughs> half, they're like, um, they'll, they'll just list off, you know, 20 things that they ate. And I'm like, well, okay, well, don't eat any of those things anymore. Like, I can't tell them that. So um, at least this way, you know, we've got a place to start and then, you know, a roadmap to kind of um, figure out, well, you know, these are higher risk maybe. So let's try avoiding those and see how you feel. And if that's not the issue, then we can incorporate them back in and avoid these. And so it's kind of like, you know, these are so popular right now, these elimination diets where people are just avoiding 
you know, entire food groups all together just to see how they feel or just to, um, just cause you know, that's the trends nowadays. But when it comes to performance, like, you know, that's, it's really worthwhile to find these things that could be causing you some serious problems. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a, an issue that can cause a lot of, uh, physical performance decrements but it can just be really mentally taxing as well like if you if you're stuck in this rut where every single time you go out to train or compete you're dealing with you know gi issues and you i've got you know i've got one client who's struggling with gi issues on a daily basis not just when he's training but because he's having that you know ongoing it's having serious effects on his training and then um yeah, like I think I've mentioned this before on a previous podcast. So for those watching or listening, forgive me, but um, the contrast is crazy. Like Nick, the guy I had on not too long ago, he said his pre-race meal was two pop tarts and a and a cup of coffee, and like he would do that like almost right before running, and never had a problem, you know. And then there's a, a guy on my team who had to eat four hours before we would race and so if we had an 8 a.m race he was up at 4 a.m trying to get something in his stomach and you know if he had anything three hours two hours an hour before then he was going to be in trouble he was going to be like he's going to have to stop the race and and you know it's it's coming out one way or another you know so <laughs> and then like for me it was you know I was kind of middle of the road where you know, not even middle of the road, like stuff didn't really affect me that much. I'd usually eat something within an hour, sometimes even 30 minutes of running. And I never, never had any problems. So like the, uh, the spectrum is quite vast and figuring out where you're at, you know, where you exist on that can be, um, can be tough. And like you said, if it changes as you age and as you, as your uh, your training distance changes or your, your competition length changes either shorter or faster. That's going to have some effects too. So, um, yeah, it's all, all really important stuff to know. So I think you touched on a key point there that I didn't really mention, which is the timing, right? Like I'm not saying to avoid these foods all of the time. I'm Mm. just saying, you know, that, and you know, the one to four hours is kind of that window. And, you know, if you're someone who really struggles, then you may have to give yourself that time, which can be hard for, you know, particularly the younger athletes because they're in school all day and then they're rushing to this, that, and the other thing. And so they're getting the right foods in at the right time can be a little bit more complicated. And as soon as you all of a sudden need to have portable foods, well, that's limiting what you can eat as well. And, you know, if you're like, well, I don't have access to a fridge or I can't cook right before or within, then you have to be a little bit more creative. For sure. Yeah. No, that's the, the restraints that we have now on, on times and schedules can have a huge impact, I think for sure. So, um, so going forward into the future, both, uh, related to research and related to just general recommendations for the public where um what's what's the next step how can we understand these issues better what are i guess what are your recommendations as a as a researcher and as uh someone who's making these recommendations to to athletes yeah so this research certainly is correlational research we're looking at effects. So we're saying, you know, as meat intake increases, we notice people are reporting more problems. So that type of research is a great starting point, but it needs to be carried on with what we would call more of a clinical trial, right? So we would, in that case, then pick out these foods that either work or don't work for people and then actually put them in scenarios designed to test them. So as I've already mentioned, we're now looking at um, protein pre-running and amounts. So we're looking at whey protein intakes and seeing if, um, you know, what, what is possibly a threshold because while we have carbohydrate recommendations pre-exercise, we don't really actually have protein recommendations pre-exercise. Um, 
So we kind of want to look a little bit more carefully at this because just saying, you know, lots of people avoid this food doesn't necessarily mean that that food is causing a problem um, until you actually control all of the other factors. But you can't do a clinical trial on every food. Like there's thousands of foods and you, you can, <laughs> that takes a lot of resources. So what we're yeah. trying to do is we're trying to say, okay, you know what, these are the 10 that people are saying they're avoiding most frequently let's take a little bit more of a careful look at them let's actually put people on chocolate pre-exercise and see does it actually increase the the symptoms or not mm. so that's where we'd kind of like to go with this so that we can give people a little bit more clear recommendations um i've already mentioned looking at this data in the in people with IBS or IBD, so we can get some recommendations for individuals who actually have gastrointestinal issues because exercise may be beneficial. And so how can we help people within those constraints uh, exercise? Because, you know, we want to keep as many people exercising as we can always. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other part that I didn't actually talk about in this particular paper is that we do also have we had a question in the survey, which was, what do you actually eat before mm. running? So we're going to look at that and we've categorized that data so we can say, you know what, these are the top 10 things that people avoid. These are the top 10 things that people consume. Here's a starting point for you. And it ultimately is going to become trial and error. And I think that's one of the lessons that I've learned sort of most recently in my research is that a lot of the basics for or a lot of the impetus for the scientific studies that we do actually can and should come from the athletes themselves. So, you know, we have this idea that it should be science telling the athletes what to do. Uh, but I find in a lot of cases, the athletes are saying, you know what, this is what's working for me. And then science is saying, okay, let's take a look at that and see if there's something to it or not. So I'm mm -hmm. really appreciating more the two-way communication between the athlete and the researcher lately and so don't be you know don't be afraid to say you know what this is this is what works for me and it might there might not be the scientific evidence to support it yet but it might just be because nobody thought of testing it so you know reach out and share what's working and what's not <laughs> awesome yes very cool so um what are some of the uh, what are some of your other research interests outside of, of this specific topic? Uh, yeah, so my other main area that I'm researching right now is actually working with uh, Paralympic athletes. So I've done some dietary assessments with Paralympic athletes, um, looking a lot at um, athletes with spinal cord injuries mm. and recommendations there and how they should change because we don't really have recommendations. We have able-bodied recommendations, but there's a lot of factors that are different. Um, between a, an athlete with a spinal cord injury and a non-injured athlete. So looking mm -hmm. at potentially how can we help there? And um, I mean, right now, obviously things are limited. A lot of face-to-face -face research has been shut down. So we're looking at some sport nutrition knowledge as well and looking at does that actually affect people's diet quality? So if they know more about mm -hmm. nutrition, does that actually mean that they're going to improve their diet? <laughs> Hopefully the answer is, is yes there. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> That's awesome. My so, life work will not be wasted. <laughs> yes. Yes, for sure. So um, for those out there who uh, would like to follow your work uh, more closely or to reach out to you with questions or, or um, to let you know what they eat that works for them, um, how, how would they do that? Yeah, so um, I have a, an email, which I believe I gave you. It's just J-P-A-R-N-E-L-L -L at mtroyal.ca. Uh, I do have a Twitter, um, but I don't actually tweet. I just follow people. <laughs> <laughs> so I always joke that it's like the geekiest Twitter ever because I'm just following all kinds of scientific researchers on it. <laughs> um, 
And I guess that would be the main way. I do love to publish open access when I can, because a lot of science is funded by public money, and I think it should be publicly available. Mm. So you can just Google all of a lot of my articles, and if you find one that you'd like and it's a fee, I can also give you a version or a rundown of the data that way too. Awesome. Yeah. So I was. It's funny you mentioned Twitter. I was just scrolling through Twitter this morning. And uh, somebody that I follow had retweeted um, uh, someone asking a question, just saying, hey, it, essentially running a poll, um, yeah. like, is it OK to reach out to a scientist or a professor that I've never had or don't know to ask them for a copy of their whatever study? So what's your take on that? Like, I think, yeah, like the more people that you can get your your work out to and more people that you can share that knowledge with the better, right? Like, I think that's kind of, um, uh, almost a compliment for somebody to, to contact you and say, Hey, I'm really interested in your work. Can you send me a copy of this study instead of having to pay, you know, whatever, 35, 40 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever the cost is sometimes for some of the, to, for access to some of these papers. Yeah, I mean, obviously, each individual researcher is going to have their preference. I mean, you can only you can only manage so many emails between researchers and students and general public, but there's no harm in in reaching out and trying. Some researchers uh, may not be able to give you a copy of the article because the journal may have copyright restrictions. But mm. even within the copyright restrictions, if they can't give you a formal version of the article, they can usually give you um, like a preprint or uh, at least a, the data set mm -hmm. um, or a summary of the information. ResearchGate is pretty good for being able to get articles as well. So a lot of researchers will have a profile on ResearchGate. You can find me there as well. And sometimes they will post copies of their, their manuscripts there or mm. um, a preprint. So it's not, not the official version, but it has all of the data and the basics of the information there. Um, depends on the different countries where you're at. In Canada, there's a real push um, for any government funded research to be available free. So even if it's not the actual printed article, the data sets uh, are increasingly becoming available open access. Mm. So I would encourage people to try. I mean, if you're really mm -hmm. interested, you might as well try. The worst that happens is they're going to ignore you. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, that's that's life, right? Sometimes you <laughs> we don't always get what we want. <laughs> awesome. So uh, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Um, I like to give all my guests uh, time at the very end just to um, – just to share something uh, that you think is really important. It, it can be uh, related specifically to this, to this topic. It can be completely off topic. So um, what's something that you think everyone watching or listening needs to hear today? Yeah, I think I would just say, you know, if you are struggling with symptoms and a lot of people are just keep trying different things and keep talking to other athletes you know don't be shy because it's not always the most pleasant thing to talk about like hey oh my gosh I'm having really horrible diarrhea when I run what's going on here <laughs> <laughs> might be a bit uncomfortable for some people yes. but just know that you know possibly up to 90% of the people are in the same boat as you. So yeah. try and figure out what they're doing, um, read around and try to come up with some solutions because they're, most people find a way. They find that one thing that works for them and then they can stick with it and they're good to go from there. Awesome. There's hope. Perfect. Good. There's a light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Dr. Parnell, thank you again so much. Um, I really appreciate it. I know everybody who watches or listens to this is going to uh, glean some some practical knowledge from it and be able to apply it and um, have fewer GI issues going forward. So, Awesome. Well, thanks for, yeah, thanks for having me on. Hopefully it helps some people. For sure. I'm sure it will. All righty, y'all. Thanks for watching and listening and stay tuned for next week's episode. Adios.